The following program is intended for an adult audience. Viewer discretion is advised. Even now, it is terrifying to imagine what they must have been thinking. It was the last day of June 2009, the end of a long day and a long drive. As the car moved closer to the water, did they know what was about to happen? Did they struggle? Did they scream? Were they even alive? It wasn't until daylight that the bodies of the Shafia women were found. There were four of them, three sisters and a wife, women who for months, each in her own way, had been struggling to be free. This is a good day for Canadian justice. Our democratic society protects the rights of all. The conviction when it came two and a half years later was a relief. A father, a mother, a brother are now in prison for what they did, sentenced to a life term. But there are still so many questions. Land on shores. <laughs> How, in a country where women are supposed to be free, did they become targets? Why were their calls for help answered with silence? Tonight on The Fifth Estate, we'll take you inside the lives of Zainab, Sahar, Giti, and Rona. You'll hear from people who knew of their struggle. She was afraid that uh, he would kill her. From relatives who tried to intervene. If the truth be told, they lived like prisoners in that house. And in exclusive interviews from young men who fell in love with the girls but could not save them. She said if ever her father or her brother finds out, she would get killed. It was 2008 Montreal, at a high school locker, the shy beginnings of a romance. I think she was just special. i never seen anybody like that. Like, she had that traction that pulled me toward her. She was Zainab Shafia, 18, newly arrived from Dubai. He was Amar Wahid from Pakistan originally. Enrolled in the same adult education program, there was a spark. And with Valentine's Day approaching, Amar screwed up his courage and gave her a card. I wrote on the note, uh, I'd like to be your friend, I'd like to know you. And if you think this is appropriate, and if you accept my friendship, just wear white dress tomorrow. So the next day when it was Valentine's Day, I saw her from far and I saw her dressed in white. But there were things Amar needed to understand. In an email two days later, Zainab laid out what she said would have to be the rules of their friendship. Rule number one, beware my brother. Amar wasn't surprised. Her family is probably not that open-minded. So I told myself, like, whatever, I have to be extra careful. Because if her brother finds out, she's the one who's going to get in trouble at home. Home was this apartment in northeast Montreal. The Shafias, Mohammed, his wife Tuba, and their seven children had emigrated to Canada the year before. From Afghanistan originally, they'd spent 11 years in Dubai, where Mohammed built a successful used car business. He was rich enough to qualify for Quebec's immigrant investor program, and he did invest. Two million dollars for this strip mall in Laval. Two hundred thousand dollars for a piece of land on which he started to build a family homestead. But Mohammed Shafia was also a secretive man. Five months after the family arrived, he sponsored another immigrant. Rona Amir, he told authorities, was a cousin who was coming to work as a nanny and a housekeeper. Lawyer Sabine Venturelli helped the family with the immigration documents, but from the beginning, something didn't seem right. 
When I asked her the question about her marriage, she started to answer me, and Mr. Shafia stopped her, saying, there's no need to talk about that. No wonder the truth would have disqualified the family as new Canadians. Rona was not Shafia's cousin, but his first wife, a woman who'd led a desperately unhappy life that she chronicled in a journal. After getting married, my lot in life began a downward spiral, right up to today that I am writing these memoirs. The pages are personal and tinged with bitter disappointments, most of them starting when Rona learned she couldn't have children. My husband started picking on me. At home, he would find fault with my cooking and serving meals, and he would find excuses to harass me. It reached a point where I had to say, go and take another wife. What can I do? Polygamy is permitted in Afghanistan, and in 1988, Shafia did take another bride, Tuba. That's Rona standing loyally on his other side. According to her diary, there was tension from the beginning, and it got worse as one after another, the babies arrived. Every day he used to sit together with his second wife and the rail against me. Then he began hitting me. The children came in and said to him, Dad, stop hitting her. In short, he had made life a torture for me. After 20 years, the move to Montreal might have been the start of something better for Rona. The Shafia family now lived in one of the most cosmopolitan and liberal cities in the world but inside the apartment, it was the worst of Afghan tradition. Latif Hideri is Tuba's uncle. Like most immigrants, his family adapted to Canadian ways, but he could see that the women in the Shafia house were never going to get the opportunity. <laughs> If the truth be told, they lived like prisoners in that house. They had no freedom. For example, my daughter was getting married and I invited them. They made dresses for them. And when their father came and saw the dresses, he cut them and did not allow them to take part in the wedding. For Zainab and Amar, dating became a game of cat and mouse. Moments snatched at the library, away from the prying eyes of her younger brother, Hamad, who attended the same school. He cannot see us together, because the time when, he, when he's going to get to see us together, right there, she, she's like, he's going to go home and he's going to tell my dad, and then things not going to look good. Did she tell you what would happen? <laughs> she told me she would get hit or she would get beaten up. She even said certain times that she would, her father would kill her. He's that type of man. And I'm like, you, you, that's just in your head. You can't think like that. I'm like, he will never kill you. She's like, you don't know. She kept on repeating, you don't know my father. It wasn't just Zainab who was afraid. Her sister Sahar was 16 and chafing at her father's insistence that she wear the hijab. At some point, Saar missed school for a long period with absolutely no reason. And that's when we started being worried. The day she came back to school, she was veiled. Vice Principal Natalie Laramé says it was clear the headscarf was only the beginning of Sahar's problems. The young girl was greatly preoccupied. She feared for her well-being. She had a lot of trouble accepting the veil. I think she really wanted to live in a Western lifestyle. And so, in the hours she was away from home, she did, chucking her headscarf and piling on the makeup at school, resuming her role as pious daughter at home. Eventually, though, her parents caught on and the leash got even shorter. Tuba would drive the children to their school. At 12 o'clock, when they had an hour break, Tuba would bring them back home. She would take them and then she would pick them up again at the end of school. They did not have the permission to contact anyone. 
or go over to anyone's house. But then in the spring of 2008, the girls got a break. Their parents returned to Dubai on a business trip, leaving Hamad, their brother, in charge. When Zainab made the mistake of sneaking her boyfriend into the house, Hamad went crazy, threatening to tell their parents and then taking action of his own. Zainab, her younger brother, decreed would not be allowed to return to school. So he had that power over, the, over her that he could stop her from going well, to school? Well, I went in that conversation, I asked her how come, because you're the oldest, yeah. and how come he's making decisions for you even if, even if you were the youngest, he, he has no right. She's like, yeah, but when my father and mother left, they gave him all the authority. So she's like, I had to agree to that. Hamid's other decree, Zainab could not see Amar again. Did you love her? Yes, I did. And she loved you? Yeah. For almost a year, Amar lost contact. Zainab never did return to school. But younger sister Sahar was still going to class and starting to talk to her teachers. She said she was a victim of violence. She was afraid of being abused again. She felt she was watched at school by other family members who then reported what they saw at home. The more Sahar told them, the more worried the teachers became. They wondered whether she might be suicidal. According to Rona, there was a suicide attempt. Sahar mixed some poison one day and drank it. When I came in and saw what had happened, I was very upset and said, why do you want death? Why did you take medicine to commit suicide? Her mother said she can go to hell. Let her kill herself. If her mother wasn't concerned, the school certainly was and called Quebec's Child Welfare Service. A social worker was sent to talk to Sahar and then with her parents. It didn't go well. With her father raging, Sahar retracted her complaint. There was no follow-up, and the file was closed. When we come back, Zainab and Amar are reunited. But inside the house of Shafia, a deadly plan is taking place. Good afternoon, 911. Uh, there's a person missing uh, in the family. Uh, I want to report that, a uh, female. Is that your uh... sister? The story of the Shafias is a story about women's desire for freedom and a father's demand for control. But there was one thing not even Mohammed Shafia could control in his house, technology. Nearly a year after she was banned from seeing her boyfriend, Amar Wahid, eldest daughter Zainab was secretly back in touch with him and one day snuck out to meet him. And so we went to, uh, we went to McDonald's. We stayed together for about like four or five hours. And uh, it was amazing because I, Saw her after one year. She told Amar that for months after he was caught at her house, her father confined her to her room, refused to let her go to school. Now she wanted out. So she's like, I feel that's, I don't feel like living a life like this where I have to, I have to say everything, I have to ask for permission, I have no freedom. And then she like, <clears throat> even if we do want to get married, my parents are not going to agree to it. So it's like, I want to leave. Amar wasn't so sure. He had no job and no apartment. He asked Zainab to wait just a few weeks. She was going, she said, with his help or without. So she's like, you're coming to get me right, right now <clears throat> or else I'm going to leave on my own. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to come pick you up. It was a brazen departure, and in the Shafia house, it set off another crisis. 
UFO 911. Yeah, uh, I, I wanna. Uh, there's a person missing uh, in the family. Uh, I wanna report that. In your family? Yeah. Is that your uh, sister? Your sister. How old is she? Uh, she's 19. It was Brother Hamad who called the police and demanded they find Zainab and bring her home. Unbeknownst to him, one of the other children also called, looking for protection, terrified of how their father would react. And so for the second time in a year, the authorities were dealing with the Shafia family. When police arrived at the house, the children were open, telling them of repression and abuse. But then their father came home and the stories began to change. In a report, the social worker said the children appeared to live under a reign of terror. But once again, intervention was not recommended. There was one adult inside the house who knew the truth and who might have been able to help if she hadn't been so powerless herself. First wife Rona's diary documents the fear and the threats. Tuba was clearly the preferred wife, and Rona knew it. She had my passport. Tuba used to say, your life is in my hands. I said, you can't kick me out. You are one wife of his, I am another. She said, you are not his wife. You are my servant. That much seemed to be true. Rona wasn't even allowed to use the house phone. With $50 she got each month as allowance, she bought phone cards and poured out her heart to distant relatives in distant lands. She called again and again and again, and then every time she called, she would talk more about the abuse and about the mental, verbal, and physical abuse. Fahima Vorgetz, a niece living in the United States, counseled Rona to leave, but she was too afraid. Because he did told her if she leaves, he would kill her. He threatened her if she leaves or if she goes to the police, they, they will kick her out of uh, Canada. They will send her back to Afghanistan. And again, she was afraid if she goes back to Afghanistan, then the Shafi's family would kill her there. So um, she was in, in a lose-lose situation. Rona was right. They were trying to get rid of her. Lawyer Sabine Venturelli remembers a phone call from one of Mohammed Shafia's relatives. She called me to tell me that there were some problems in Mr. Shafia's family and that Mr. Shafia was therefore asking me to close the file and to see to it that Madame Rona left Canada. He was offering to pay me a fee, and I'm talking about a substantial amount of money. He was offering to pay me $10,000. She declined the offer. In the meantime, Zainab was staying at a women's shelter, desperately trying to hide from her parents. But they had a Mars telephone number, and the next thing he knew, he had a call from police. It was a lady, and she said, uh, we have a complaint against you for that you kidnapped Zainab. Kidnapped her? Yeah. <clears throat> I'm like, OK. Uh, so I'm like, who said that to you? She's like, the father and the brother. Zainab then took the phone and told police she wanted nothing to do with her family. The officer agreed that at 19 it was her right, and she called the Shafias back. She told them that, listen, she is with Amar. She left on her own. We don't want you guys to call her or even call me and bother her, bother both of them. Leave her alone. If we hear any complaint from them against you guys, then we'll have to take actions. But the warning to stay away didn't work. Amara and Zainab had made it clear they wanted to get married. Soon, her mother, Tuba, was at the shelter in tears, promising to arrange the wedding if only Zainab would come home. To Amar's everlasting regret, he encouraged her to go. So I'm like, you should think about it. Maybe they're serious. Maybe she's, because what made me believe the most that when she said that if you're scared of your father, I'll leave him, I'll go rent out a separate apartment, and you could come live there until you get married, and then I'll go back and live with them. 
that made me believe that, okay, she's, she's actually serious about it. But that never happened. While Mohammed Shafia was again in Dubai, Zainab returned to the house with her mother. Two weeks later, as promised, there was a wedding. Amar still remembers that day as the happiest of his life, but the celebration was doomed to be short-lived. His family didn't like the arrangement any better than Zainab's. The empty seats at the reception were a sharp rebuke to a family obsessed with honor. To this day, Amar still doesn't understand what happened next. There was a 15, 20 minute talk between her and her brother and her mother. I don't know what happened during those 15, 20 minutes. She came up to me and she told me, I, have, I, can't, I can't do this. So I don't know what they told her because she was crying and she's like, I love you, but I cannot do this. Cannot come, I cannot leave my family. What do you think of that? Until, until today, I'm still thinking about the answer. I'm still looking for the answer. I don't know what, what they told her. Oh, it felt terrible that a day before I get married and I'm so happy, and not even 24 hours later, it's just everything is finished. As quickly as they were married, the couple was divorced. Six weeks later, the bride would be dead. Today, Amar has no doubt the wedding was part of a much bigger plan. It was all a, it was all a game they played to bring her back home. And then they wanted to do this to them, to kill them. And it was just a setup they did. So they, they agreed to the wedding to lure her back to the house? Yeah, just so to So they prove could kill her? Do you think they had a plan at that point to kill her? I agree. I think they, they did have a plan. We may never know exactly when the plan was hatched, but in the late spring of 2009, there was a lot of fear in the Shafia house. Among the calls Rona placed was one to her sister in France, worried about a conversation she'd overheard. She said she heard the voice of Shafia saying, I will go to Afghanistan, and when I come back, I will kill Zainab. Rona said, Another voice asked, what about the other one? And he said, I will kill them too. Her voice was shaking. I told her, my dear sister, do not worry too much. You are not in Afghanistan or Dubai. You are in Canada, and it is an advanced country. Nothing will happen there. By now, Sahar also had a boyfriend. Ricardo Sanchez was from Honduras, and he had to be a secret, too. If she would have mentioned that she had a boyfriend who was Latino, it would have created problems with her family. As with her sister, dating was an exercise in subterfuge. One day, Ricardo and Sahar were also caught by her brother. He was insisting, who are you, who are you? How did you meet her? Are you her boyfriend? Yes or no, tell me the truth. I said, no, no, no. I had to take Sahar's friend and pretend that she was my girlfriend. By the spring of 2009, Sahar was in full rebellion and teachers weren't sure what to do. Not only was she missing class, she was losing weight. They worried about things like eating disorders and even drugs. It all came to a head the day Sahar fainted at school and had to be hospitalized. Despite repeated calls to her family, no one came. And so the school placed another call to child welfare. When the teacher called, she said she was concerned for Sahar's life. But the person at the other end said, since she was 17 and a half, almost an adult, they would not deal with the complaint and suggested Sahar look for help elsewhere. The school was aghast, insulted. Outraged. Then there was little sister Giti. 
At 13, she was also acting out, skipping school and getting caught shoplifting. At one point, she told her teachers she wanted to be put in a foster home. In notes and in cards, it's clear Giti idolized her big sisters, especially Sahar. It was her dream that when Sahar finally did leave home, she'd take Giti with her. But it was never to be. By June, the plan was in place. Computer records show that Hamad spent hours online that month, looking at maps of eastern Ontario, checking out rivers, remote lakes, bodies of water of any kind. Thousands of websites were visited at all hours of the day and night. On June 20th, a final chilling search. When we return, the Shafias go on vacation. I don't know, I don't know where you're going with this, honestly. Uh, to be honest with you, man, I don't know where you're going with this, okay? In the house of Shafia, life was never predictable, but in June 2009, things turned very strange. After her hasty wedding and even hastier divorce, Zainab was bracing for her father's return from Dubai, emailing Amar of her plan to apologize in the hopes he forgets everything. A few days later, she calls, she has been forgiven, and life at home is different. Well, she said her father is, is completely changed. He's not the same guy that he used to be. He's not as strict. There's, there's something fishy. It's not normal for a human being to change. It's 50 years mentality in, in a month. Things are apparently so good now, the Shafias are taking a vacation to Niagara Falls. Dad, Hamad, and the younger kids in the family's Lexus the women in a newly purchased Nissan Sentra. After so many months of upheaval, there is finally a sense of calm. They take in all the usual tourist attractions and cell phone pictures show the sisters in rare moments of fun. Hamming it up in the hotel room with Rona, taking turns primping for the camera. The one person missing is Hammond. His cell phone shows he's backtracked from Niagara Falls and is now in Kingston, near the city's famous but secluded locks. He rejoins the family as they check out of the hotel and they drive through the night again in two cars. As she has the whole trip, Sahara is texting, snapping photos as they pass through Toronto. At 1.38 a.m., she receives a final text from her boyfriend. By then, the Shafias are in Kingston, near the locks. If there are witnesses to what happened next, they've never spoken. Somehow, some way, four women in a Sentra ended up dead at the bottom of the lock. The next morning, Kingston police had the gruesome task of identifying the bodies. This is an, a very emotional incident, and um, you know what, what bothers me is the fact that there, uh, you know, there's three three sisters, and that, and it's the unknowns. So we're we're still uh, trying to ascertain, you know, the why, the why, the why. But before the why, there was the how. On the surface, there weren't many clues. A few scattered pieces of what appeared to be a broken headlight. Then there was the Sentra. If it had been driven into the lock, why was the ignition off? Why were the seat belts locked and the front seats fully reclined? The women were found in only two meters of water and yet there was no sign any of them had tried to escape. As police puzzled at the scene, at headquarters, a missing persons report was about to be filed by the Shafias. Tuba is the first to explain what she knows. One moment, they'll be ready for everything. Her theory, the girls stole the car and drove it into the canal. Okay. 
qui l'a répété que ma le bossard est chose de tout le bac c'est moteur qui est le bossard pour le bic. Bah c'est tout mais quand on fait mon hobby. When he's questioned, Muhammad claims to know even less. You know the car, your car, the Nissan was found underwater. Yes, any thoughts, any idea how it got there? No. No. Okay. By the time Hamad takes a chair, he's defensive. But you know what? I'm telling you, and I'm already in, uh, in a lot of mess. Yeah. I don't know what, what you're doing. Uh, if you want to blame it on me, I don't. I don't know. I don't know where you're going with this, honestly. But Hamad shares one piece of information that will prove critical. At 7:30 that morning, he placed a call to 911, reporting an accident with the Lexus. Hello, uh, hello. Had uh, an accident uh, on San Yunus. Are you injured, sir? Uh, no, no, just uh, car damage. Oh, okay. How many cars are involved? Uh, one. It's uh, with the pool. Strangely, it happened in an empty parking lot, and not in Kingston, but 300 kilometers away in Montreal. When police searched the Shafia's garage in Montreal, they found the Lexus with a broken headlight. In the days that followed, the drownings were big news, reported as a joyride gone wrong. But in his gut, Amar knew it wasn't true. This cannot be an accident. Then everything just came back to me, what she used to say her father would do this to her if she would ever go against her and all that. I'm like, she was right. I was really angry. I went to her house, called her house number, and then Hamid picked up. I'm like, where is Zainab? He's like, what does it concern you? I'm like, where is Zainab? He's like, come to my house and I'll tell you where she is. I'm like, I'm outside your house. I need to know where she is. And uh, he just hung up the phone on me. I went knocking the door, nobody opened the door. He wasn't allowed in, but when the media came knocking, the Shafias were more than willing to put their grief on display. For days, they stuck to their story. Come with me, uh, tell, uh, give me a key. I want clothes, I take key after I do. Unaware that by now, the police were onto them. Wiretaps and intercepts from listening devices placed in their cars revealed the shocking truth. These are the conversations that would condemn them. Mohammed in full rage against his daughters. <laughs> At one point, Tuba sounds almost remorseful. No other way than to die, he says, because there's nothing more important than honor. It took police only three weeks to crack the case. Whether they were already dead or still alive, the women were pushed into the water by the Lexus. It was indeed murder. The Shafias, mother, father, and son, were on their way to prison. In the end, the conviction was swift. The jury deliberated 15 hours before dispatching Mohammed Shafia, his wife Tuba, and eldest son Hamid to prison for life. 
for the police and for the Crown, it was an important message well sent. This verdict sends a very clear message about our Canadian values and the core principles in a free and democratic society that all Canadians enjoy and even visitors to Canada enjoy. But the fact remains what was happening inside the House of Shafia was not a secret. That the women felt threatened and at risk was known to family members, to teachers, and at three different times to the people whose job it is to protect children in Quebec. When 17-year-old Sahar told teachers of abuse and they told child welfare she might be suicidal. When Zainab ran away with her boyfriend and social workers went into the Shafia home. When Geeti was pleading to be taken into foster care and Sahar was turned away for being too old. Each time, nothing was done. The head of Quebec's Child Welfare Service says part of the problem is that until this incident, social workers didn't appreciate the risk of what is called honor killing. Michelle Dion. The threat of an honor crime was not part of our understanding. It was not part of the risks that we were assessing. Now, it is. But at the end of the day, abuse is abuse and violence is violence. And, and whether you attach the name honor to it or not, the risk of violence is something you should have acted on. I understand the question. But when we stepped in, we intervened in a situation where the allegations had still to be verified. When we did the assessment, the threat was not presented the same way. The concerns were not the same as in the beginning. When we got there, something had happened and the children didn't have quite the same story. The children were more calm. We didn't have the same picture as when we first got there. It's, is it surprising that a child with, with the abuser sitting right there would, would recant the story? We have to understand that in this situation, we did an emergency intervention on a Friday night. And when we got there, the children were at home and the parents had already returned. We were caught in an unfavorable situation, I agree. But that's reality. But that doesn't explain why they didn't monitor the family, why they didn't liaise with the school, when she heard what happened to the Shafia girls, Vice Principal Natalie Larame had an immediate, instinctive reaction. This was not an accident. When we talk about this event, our emotions are at the surface. Great frustrations, anger, I can almost say resentment towards the system. And all the teachers, day after day, feel guilty. Could I have done more? Did I do everything I could have done? Did I handle it well? The women who died together are buried together in a cemetery outside Montreal. For the family of Rona, the first wife, visits are particularly hard. Several times, she begged Fahima Vorgat to meet her at the border and sneak her into the United States. I felt so guilty. I felt so guilty. I thought probably I should have gone to the border and brought her to the country, to here. So it was illegal. So what? I should have done it. So many things, so many things I could have done, which I failed to do. And she would tell me, you're like my, my last hope. Don't have anybody. And that's what I, it always clings here. You're my last hope. But for some, the burden of what wasn't done in life is made lighter by what they've managed to do 
in the aftermath of their deaths. Despite threats from some in the Afghan community, Latif Hideri testified against his own niece, Tuba. It is my responsibility to fight for justice for someone who cannot fight for themselves. I tell the truth for them. They were labeled as whores, thieves, bad-mannered girls by their family. And the Afghan community has accepted it. I want to tell the Afghan community that these are all wrong. Their deaths are a crime. These girls died for no reason, for not doing anything. No one knows that better than Amar. Not a day goes by, he says, when he doesn't think of Zainab and wonder if there was anything he could have done to save her. Maybe if I had not approached her the first time when I saw her, she could have been still living. Or even if I did approach her, if I would have done certain things a different way, if I had not tell her to go back and listen to her mom and not believe their mom, things would have been different. Everybody looks back now and wonders if they could have done something. Do you feel that? Do you feel responsible? Well, sometimes I do feel guilty because where I feel that if I was able to take a step to take her out of the house, I should have went further. I should have should have stood up more. And I feel like I should have stood up directly to her father and to her brother, which I didn't do it. Maybe they would have listened or maybe they would have reacted differently. Who knows? And uh, I wasn't worried about the outcome, how they would react towards me. But she would have been, she would have been alive. Zainab and Amar were married less than 24 hours, but he still thinks of her as his wife. It was my dream to marry you, she told him in one of her last emails. We had an amazing love story together. The last time she wrote, she signed off, best friends for life. This is one promise, no one can make me break. As of this week, Mohammed Shafia, his wife Tuba, and their son Hamad have all filed appeals of their convictions. Stay with us, the Fifth Estate returns. Welcome back. And now here's a look at what's coming up on the Fifth Estate. I'm Lyndon McIntyre. Her pain was relentless. Somebody did you a favor and said, yes. try this. Yeah. It'll make you feel better. Yeah. And did it? Sure did. It was a pill called OxyContin. The relief was temporary. The cost, a lifetime. She was started on these medications for the first time by a doctor. The trouble was the doctors were systematically misled in their medical training, in their practices, but mostly by the drug company that ignored the early warning signs. Information came to the company that something indeed was going wrong here. And now Canadian taxpayers pick up the tab in addiction treatment clinics across the country. I'm faced with the complications on a daily basis. I see the carnage. Coming soon on the Fifth Estate, that's our program for this week. I'm Julian Finley. For everyone here at the Fifth Estate, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.